Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be back. Um, certainly, I'm sure none of you have seen this before. I mean, I know we don't like to talk about rare conditions in this lecture stage. We want to be high yield. But if you bear with me, you may recognize something in this presentation. All right. <clears throat> So, allergic rhinitis. Allergic rhinitis has been around for a long time, and it's been bothering people for a long time. This is a report from ancient Rome, where Augustus Caesar had recurrent bouts of seasonal disorders during the beginning of the spring, just before his birthday, believed in to result in tightening and enlargement of the diaphragm, and associated with the occurrence of, you know, I have to look up the pronunciation of that. It's runny nose. All right, I don't know how to pronounce that. All right, okay. <clears throat> you may have seen this patient before. 35-year-old male. History of asthma. Doc, I'm stuffed all the time. I got this drainage. My head hurts. I'm, <clears throat> I have throat clearing, and I can't function at work. How many of you have seen this patient? Okay, there's actually some people who have not seen this patient before, and you live in Louisville. Amazing. Amazing. Anyways, obviously, when you see something like that, um, you know, if you roll the dice, you probably know what's going on. But what I want to convince you, at least at the end of this talk, is that even rhinitis in the number two city for allergies in the country has a differential diagnosis. That's the only thing I want you to walk out of this. For, okay, that's not the only thing, but that's a really important point I want you to think about. That's all. Just take two, just take two seconds to think about, is there a possible other condition that could explain the patient's symptoms? That's all. All right. So um, my hope by the end of this talk is that we're going to discuss the differences between Nasal inflammation that's allergic versus non-allergic. So you'd be able to evaluate, treat them, know when you would see, they need to see the allergist. And I want you to recognize that the airway is the airway. So the same respiratory epithelium in the upper airway, uh, there's much similarity with the lower airway. So just be cognizant that every time you have someone presenting with a rhinitis or sinus complaint, in your view system, you'd be very curious about concurrent lower airway disease. All right. So you, you examine this patient. You may see something like this. You might see this linear crease <clears throat> across the nose here. That's done by the physical action of him rubbing upwards. He does this multiple times a day as he's trying to wipe his nose. You may notice that he has a box of tissues, or he's using a lot of tissues, and he's trying to he's sort of overwhelmed by just trying to keep up ways with the intense nasal rhinorrhea that continues to occur here. Um, how many of you do a nasal exam? Oh my goodness, that's fifty percent. That's better than not nobody. So the the otoscope can be used in the nose. I know it says otoscope, but look in the nose. Why? Because you're going to know what's normal and what's not normal. So this is what you would see if you looked, on, <coughs> looked into the nose, past the nasal alar. You see this structure here, which is the inferior turbinate, and here's the middle turbinate. So here you see the inferior turbinate here, and then you see this little guy back here, and that's the middle turbinate. You may be able to see that if you didn't live in Louisville, because most likely you'll see something like this. You will see the inferior turbinate markedly swollen. It has a pale appearance. There'll be mucus, and you can't even see the middle turbinate. <clears throat> so I just want to let you know that you see this. The patient obviously is having some sort of nasal inflammatory process, right? And, and obviously, uh, just put that in your DNA because you're going to want to know Number one, how severe it is, and how, and also if they're responding to treatment. So, um, patients can develop these linear, uh, again, markings. They call them Denny Morgan lines, and then we call these allergic shiners. Chronic nasal congestion can cause darkening underneath the eyes, and obviously you can get inflammation of the conjunctiva. One routine exam finding I'd like you to do 
is that lower the lower eyelid and look at the palpebral conjunctiva, you will notice what's normal, but also recognize concurrent allergic conjunctivitis. So, you know, patients are going to be <clears throat> coughing. And if you looked in the throat, and let me tell you, the posterior pharynx is the hardest part of my exam. It is very difficult. But if you're able to have them tilt their head back, stick their tongue out, use a tongue depressor, that sort of thing, you may see this finding. So this is a swelling of the posterior pharynx, and we call this cobblestoning. We all sort of regurgitate the differential diagnosis of the chronic cough. Chronic cough that's not infectious, we say asthma, postnasal drip, or reflux. You see this finding, you know it's postnasal drip. Done, right? You have the diagnosis, right? So again, in your physical exam, integrate visualization of posterior pharynx. It's not easy, but the more you do it, the better you'll get at doing it. So um, those, we're going to talk about headaches. And so when you specify what does your headache feel like, it'll be a pressure, it'll be either maxillary pressure, it'll be frontal pressure, it'll be sphenoid pressure. Um, it, that's not necessarily due to sinusitis. If you, you know, have a kind of nationally recognized basketball team and you drop out of the NCAA, you're going to have similar findings. So you can't use that totally, but just realize that that isn't a differential diagnosis of headache. And sleep disorders. So sleep disordered breathing. So we know that if you do surveys on patients with rhinitis, only 3% get a good night's rest. And if you're disrupting sleep, a chief complaint in your practice may be fatigue, the most generic complaint of all, right? And so if you're going to unpack fatigue in your differential diagnosis, I'd like you to integrate rhinitis or sinusitis because rhinitis has been associated with sleep problems, daytime, daytime somnolence, impaired cognition, and decreased work productivity. So it can affect work performance uh, daytime alertness, and so on. So, someone comes to me, I show you that stem, what's my approach? I have, you know, I'm immensely biased, but I have to go through the intellectual exercise of asking, is it allergic? Every single patient, force yourself to ask the question, is this allergic? And you're going to need to convince yourself if it's allergic or not, all right? So, it's you know, innocent until proven guilty that it's allergy. Because if it's not allergic, then you're going to give them the wrong therapy if you just give them Zyrtec. The patient definitely is going to come back three months later saying that that pill was useless, right? And then you're going to say, okay, well, we need to give more medicine. So instead of giving more medicine when someone fails therapy, make sure you have the correct diagnosis to begin with. Um, obviously, if they are allergic, that would be confirmed by directly by allergy testing. You can sort of inference that by response to treatment. I want to go over exposure, uh, determining the exposure, what are the concurrent conditions, performing avoidance measurement uh, measures, uh, appropriate pharmacotherapy, and then I'll talk a little bit about the role of allergy shots. Okay, again, if you roll the dice, most likely, the stem I presented to you is allergic rhinitis. We know that the prevalence of allergic rhinitis is between something around 1 in 10 and 1 in 20 Americans, all right? But we live in Louisville, Kentucky. This is the uh, Spring Allergy Capital Survey by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and we are number two. But it's getting better because last year we were number one. So maybe we'll number three next year. So we're making progress, kind of. So if we were going to determine what is the cause of the rhinitis, what do we know about that? Well, we know if you do an epidemiological review of the ideology of someone coming with the chief complaints of rhinitis, only 43% of adults are allergic. There are 23% are non-allergic, and 34% have both allergic and non-allergic triggers. Why is that important? Because if you're going to just treat someone for allergies, lack of response to treatment could also be not addressing their non-allergic triggers as well, right? So again, if you really want to help someone with their symptoms, you have to think of both. So 
what are you going to assess for non-alert triggers and how would you determine pretest probability? If we did an allergy test that day, how would you know whether they're allergic or not? Well, there was a study done by Jonathan Bernstein in Cincinnati who did questionnaires and correlated it with allergy testing results. And Dr. Bernstein found that age of onset of symptoms after 35 is predictive of non-allergic rhinitis. So let's take a step back and see, think about what that means. That means if you have a 40-year-old person that comes to you with rhinitis and I say, you know, I've got this two-year history of, you know, stuffiness and nasal congestion, and where'd you grow up? Oh, I've been in Louisville in my life. That means this patient has been living in Louisville for 38 years, have been exposed to pollen every single season, indoor, outdoor, that sort of thing, for 38 years, and then at age 38, the body decided to make the decision to become allergic. All right? So most sensitization occurs within two to three years after exposure to an allergen. So let me change this stem. We got someone who have joined U of L to join the faculty, and they're from another country, and then they came in two to three years after joining faculty. Now they're developing symptoms. That's a different situation. Now they have a new exposure. They're getting sensitized, and now they're presenting their symptoms. So remember, late onset rhinitis in an adult is very unusual for allergic rhinitis. Similarly, family history. Aller allergy is a um, has a alert has a genetic predisposition. So therefore, if you ask the patient brothers, sisters, parents, uncles, that sort of thing, and no one has a history of allergy, that would be very odd. Seasonal variation, obviously. Um, continuous symptoms would suggest more of non-allergic. Again, just hints, not like absolutes. And then some people recognize triggers like furry animals. And cat allergy is one of those very difficult um severe allergens. You know, I've had patients who are on oral steroid daily because they love their cat. So just realize, I know it's true, actually. Um, but I put her on Zola, she got better. Anyways. Um, so anyways, just realize that. Furry animals uh, is another thing you can specifically ask about. And then increased symptoms about irritants. Common indoor irritants. Oh, general question. Number one irritant in the home in Louisville, Kentucky, causing rhinitis? Anybody? Cigarette smoke, environmental tobacco smoke, absolutely. All right? If you are marinating in smoke, you will have inflammation of their upper and lower airway, right? Other uh, triggers uh, worth mentioning, think the first floor of a department store or Yankee Candle. I'm not picking on Yankee Candle, but they have these sort of aromatic airborne irritants that in certain people can cause problems. So perfumes, air fresheners, detergents, that sort of thing, think uh, as a, that as a possible cause of rhinitis, non-allergic rhinitis, non-type 1 hypersensitivity. So every, again, every time we see a patient with rhinitis, we have to go through the exercise of asking, is this non-allergic? So what is the differential diagnosis of non-allergic rhinitis? I'm going to throw out some conditions. I just want you to recognize this is an allergic rhinitis talk, but I'm just going to have you just sort of think about that ahead of time. Number one, is it really chronic rhinitis, right? Is this chronic rhinitis or is this episodic rhinitis? Maybe, the, maybe they have children and the children go to daycare. The children come home, they're in the cesspool of disease, which is daycare, and they bring them back to the, to the parents, and then they get infected. But viral infections have a beginning and the end. They'd be like 7 to 10 days, and then they'd stop. So episodic rhinitis versus chronic rhinitis is a little bit different. So you'd want to get a history about timing and duration. So vasomotor rhinitis. So interestingly, the 38, no, I'm sorry, the 40-year-old person I told you about who has late onset of symptoms, if you're going to roll the dice, the most likely reason they have rhinitis is they have developed vasomotor triggers. So what's the pathophysiology of vasomotor rhinitis? We're not sure. We think it involves the neural reflex. But the triggers for vasomotor rhinitis is you'll get stuff like weather changes, barometric pressure changes, going from a hot place to a cold place or a cold place to a hot place, a rapid change of temperature, cold air as a trigger, um, 
and, you know, and so on. So those are what we think of as the non-allergic triggers. And again, if you give Zyrtec to that person, that patient will not respond. They will not respond to a histamine blockade. Oh, gustatory rhinitis is not food allergy, but actually eating causes profuse rhinorrhea, um, usually without congestion. It's usually rhinorrhea. So occupational, what do they do for a living? Oh, you know, I work, you know, uh, in a factory, right, where they release chemicals or something like that, right? You know, you're going to want to know, do you have facial protection? So ask about occupation. Um, rhinitis mechamatosa. So rhinitis mechamatosa is repetitive use of an intranasal decongestant. Um, the typical ones used are oxymetazolin or afrin or uh, phenylephrine. Um, initially, you give that medication to someone, they're going to feel great. You give an intranasal decongestion, it just opens you up, it just stops drainage, they'll feel happy. One or two weeks into it, with daily repetitive use, they have the worst rebound you could ever think of. And then before you know it, they come back and they got afrins like in their bag, in their kitchen, in their car, you know, everywhere, right? Because they're continually using the medicine. So watch out for that. Other medications I'd ask about, um, uh, beta blockers associated with rhinitis, birth control is associated with rhinitis. Um, so there's a rhinitis of pregnancy. Um, hypothi uncontrolled hypothyroidism is associated with rhinitis, so make sure you feel the thyroid gland in all your patients. Um, Horner syndrome is associated with rhinitis. And vasculitis. So if you look into the nose and you look and you can see the other side of the nasal passage, they could have a nasal of a septal perforation, and that could be due to dis inflammatory dis Number one, that's a problem, right? But also, that would be inflammatory disruption or cocaine, right? Those are your two things in differential. Cocaine use or inflammatory destruction causing, again, nasal perforation, eventually saddle nose, right? You lose the structure and it just sort of starts, you know, uh, sinking in, all right? So obviously, you might see um, on chest rexy, you might see like uh, uh, granulomas in the lung, so like um, pulmonary nodules and that sort of thing. So Again, just keep that in the back of your mind. That's why you need to look in the nose. Um, and then, obviously, we didn't talk about it, but nasal polyposis, septal deviation, tonsil or adenoid, well, actually, adenoid hypertrophy, bullosa, and so on. So someone who's refractory to therapy, you may consider either ENT referral or imaging. So there can be anatomic reasons as well. All right, any questions about non-allergic rhinitis? I'm going to stop talking about it, but this is the one of the most important points I think is underappreciated. And it's just because we live in Louisville. Okay, very good. We'll move on. Okay, so it is allergic. I'm interested. So, again, let's say we have a different history. We got a patient who's 35. I ask brothers, sisters, and parents all have allergies. Sister has asthma. He had symptoms since he was five or six. He was tested as a kid, was positive, was on shots for a year, but it stopped. So again, it sounds like he was allergic and he was tested and that sort of thing. So how would I approach that patient? Well, I'm going to test them. I'm going to determine. I have the determination that they probably have allergies. I'm going to take direct extracts of pollen, mold, cat, dog, and so on. And basically, I use this thing called a dermapic. And I'm going to scratch their skin with it. And basically, 15 minutes later, I'm going to see this raised wheel here with an erythematous flare. So a hive, essentially. I compare this to a histamine control and a negative control. To, to The negative control is to rule out dermatographism. Dermatographism is the phenomenon that if you scratch the skin, you get mast cell degranulation. So obviously, that would be a false positive. I do interdermal testing just to increase sensitivity, just to make sure I'm not missing any p weaker allergic responses. And so what happened that caused that patient to develop a wheel and flare reaction 15 minutes later? So if you're, in your if you're in my anaphylaxis talk, you already saw this. Essentially what happens is that back when that patient was a child, maybe around, you know, the first two years of life, T cells became sensitized to, you know, pollen or that sort of thing. So we don't know why this happens. Once they do figure it out and stop it, I have to find a new job. 
But essentially, while they haven't figured this out, what we know is this T cell, uh, this T cell will tell this B cell that brings the same allergen to it, this T cell will say, okay, I know what this is, and I want you to switch on and make IgE. So the B cell will do that. It will become a plasma cell, which is an IgE making factory. Mast cells will grab onto IgE. So this is the sensitization phase. In the effector phase, you get re-exposed to the allergen, and what it does is it cross-links IgE on the surface of the mast cell, leading to mast cell degranulation, leading to itching, mucus production, swelling, asthma, bronchos, asthmatic bronchospasm, and so on. Eosinophilic, eosinophilic inflammation. And then you see that terrible nose I showed you. Um, realize if you're going to refer to the allergist, you would counsel the patient to hold their antihistamines. Usually I do that, but usually you have to hold your um, Benadryl for about three days. Uh, Claritin, you'd hold for about seven days. Um, nasal sprays that are antihistamine, you'd hold for three days, but the steroid nasal sprays, uh, Montelukast, and so on, should not interfere with the testing. The things that trip me up the most is patients on tricyclic antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. They do have sometimes antihistaminergic properties. Okay, so you may have heard of the RAS test. This is a blood test that previously used radioactivity to determine IgE content. Now we use an ELISA method. So RAS is sort of old terminology. I usually say allergen-specific IgE or Serum specific, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, specific IgE as sort of my uh, surrogate. Now, there are different ways to do it. I would say that what I'm saying here is uh, probably more relevant to food allergy than inhalant allergy, but I would mention that the class system is not really relevant. You'll see, they'll say like class three weed pollen allergy. So, what does that mean? Well, it really doesn't mean much. We really think of, um, you know, uh, IgE number is more severe, maybe, but that hasn't been uh, clinically correlated to enough specificity to have clinical meaning. So basically, I think of allergies as a binary. You're either allergic or you're not. And so what are the allergic triggers? So if you're going to take a history, what is the pattern or possible exposures that could be making this worse? You'd ask about seasonality. So Tree pollen season started late this year. It started March 15th because we had that winter that lasted forever. But it's usually February through June in, in Louisville for trees, April through July for grass. We have this little break right now. But I guarantee you, if you're ragweed allergic next month, you're going to have a bad time because weed season starts in about a month, and it's going to last until winter. So there's outdoor mold. Outdoor mold, uh, like Alternaria cladosporium. And then for the animals inside the home, dust mite, cockroach. And then there's also indoor sources of mold. So again, you're going to ask about indoor triggers, outdoor triggers, and kind of get a pattern of what could be causing the problem. So I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the unified airway hypothesis. And that's what we, what the observation that we make is that Allergic rhinitis occurs in 10 to 20% of the population, but 85% of childhood asthma. Now, in adult asthma, it's probably a little bit less. Actually, you know, uh, Rodney Foles and other collaborators are doing this elderly asthma study, and we're actually they're doing allergy skin testing, so we'll get to see the prevalence in older individuals. But essentially, if you have upper airway inflammation, you have a threefold risk of developing lower airway inflammation. And even though asthma is only in 5% of the general population, about half of your rhinitis patients in certain epidemiological studies could have concurrent asthma. Again, emphasizing the importance that you should do just a few questions asking if they have any shortness of breath or limitations with activity. Now, I know we have dyspnea as a broad differential diagnosis, but the presence of allergic rhinitis may point to that asthma could be the cause of their uh, dyspnea, and you would order spirometry in that case. You would actually screen for asthma in that situation. So please keep in mind that even though we're talking about upper airway symptoms, that should prompt you just to ask about lower airway symptoms because of the known association between upper and lower allergic airway disease. 
Okay, let's talk about environmental control. So there's no reason for this video other than I think it's interesting. So I'm going to play it. And and so what this guy is, he's with this tree and, and he shakes it. And then you just see this sort of massive cloud of pollen come out. If you're standing right here, you're not going to have a good time. I'm telling you. All right. That is impressive. So anyways, we're talking about pollen here. All right. So there are just basically multiple little grains of pollen floating through the air most of the year. Again, I'm telling you we're at this break between grass and wheat pollen season. But again, pollen grains are uh, airborne. They can travel for miles. You know, they say, oh, I got a tree outside. No, the most of the pollen you're seeing is probably all the other trees based on all the beautiful landscapes we enjoy in Kentucky, you know, and it's just blowing airborne pollen all over the city. Southern Indiana is too. You could, you could cut down every tree in Louisville. You'd still get exposed. So keep your windows closed in the house and car uh, when you're indoors. Maybe when you're um, uh, outdoors, you'd want to take your clothing off and change. If you're exposed to a lot of pollen or mold or so on, you may want to wear facial protection. And then obviously you can follow the pollen counts. What I use to follow pollen counts is this website. It's called pollen.quadai.org. You're going to see this little, you know, here's the pollen count thing here. You're going to see this little thing that here that says access sign up for my National Allergy Bureau. And the reason I ask you to click that is that you can put your email in there and then they'll send you an email when the pollen count is at a certain, pollen count is at a certain level, moderate, severe, that sort of thing. And so I tell my patients this. You know, sometimes it's very difficult to tell a patient to take their medicine if they don't feel any symptoms. But we know that allergy pharmacotherapy is more effective in a preventative stage than a treatment stage. So if they have the insight that pollen count is high, they should limit their activity and also take medicines to protect themselves before they go outside. So, again, the major tree pollen seasons... Um, uh, trees in the, uh, in the spring, late spring and summer is grass pollen season. There's this little break here, and then weed pollen season is about to start. So again, if you ask about the month of the year where this occurs, you'll get clues on what's going on. Okay, so this horrific tr creature out of a sci-fi movie is actually ubiquitous in our environment. It's called the dust mite. It eats our own skin cells. It thrives on humidity for its moisturization. If you're sitting here, you're probably not exposed to dust mite. If you lie down and you inhale dust mite matter in your pillow and mattress, that's your major point of contact. So that's where we intervene. We ask people to get bed covers that completely encase the pillow and mattress. It's zipped closed. It puts an impermeable barrier between you and the dust mite in the mattress. Stuff on top, you just wash it once a week. You just sort of drown them. And then you can, again, uh, eliminate the dust mite. I know, I'm just trying to fight you know, this relentless insect, uh, I'm sorry, mite invasion. Mites are not insects. I apologize. All right. Cockroaches. Um, cockroach basically um, is not that common in Louisville, actually. Um, but again, you'd want to get, make sure that they are promptly removing food and getting gel or bait pesticides. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Cat dander. So there is no patient in the history of my clinic has it gotten rid of a pet based on my recommendation? I'm telling you, I have a patient who has a cat in the home who loves her cat, and she's willing to take, you know, max dose inhale corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist, and I have her on anti-IG therapy because she loves her cat, all right? Anyways, again, that's my job to kind of make sure the patient is comfortable, but realize that cat is a very plucky allergen. Um, you can wash them. You could have to do it weekly. This, the evidence suggests you could do it weekly and you'd reduce cat allergen. That's not going to happen. Even if you removed a cat, the cat is still in the home. The cat allergen is still in the home for 20 weeks. You could go to a convention hall and vacuum the carpet at the front door and cat allergen would increase over time in the carpet dust. So, again, cat is a very difficult allergen. Just realize that the only thing sometimes you can accomplish is to either confine the cat out of the bedroom and try to put some sort of HEPA high-efficiency particulate uh, filtration device inside the 
um, bedroom to at least keep one area free of allergen. I mean, that's the best you can do sometimes. Again, there's an emotional attachment to pets. As an allergy, I'm immensely biased against it. So I, if there's any pet lovers, I'm so sorry. That's just how I was trained. It's like, like brainwashed because of you know the, the role of allergens. Okay, you can notice that if we remove this drywall, behind here is mold. And so you have to realize that once water involves a basement or dry, drywall, it is possible that behind the drywall, mold can grow. So surface cleaning does not remediate the problem. You actually have to physically remove the affected amounts. Uh, I mean, so the affected uh, drywall or porous surfaces. So uh, make sure you're checking for condensation, avoid the use of humidifiers, and then replace instead of surface clean. Uh, and we were talked about non-allergic triggers. Again, I'm not picking on these companies. I'm just letting you know. Very common source of indoor air pollution, all right? So let's talk about pharmacotherapy. All right, so if you had one medicine for allergic rhinitis, which of the following is the most effective medicine that treats nasal congestion and rhinorrhea and has had evidence for ocular symptoms? Nasal steroid, correct, all right? Now, that's probably the hardest one you're going to convince me to take, but that doesn't mean that's not the one that's the most effective. Again, actually, philosophically, the, mess, the best medicine is the one that they actually take. But again, second to that is efficacy once they do take the medicine. So again, you know, we always have to be very practical about these sort of things. Um, so, you know, we do non-pharmacological things first. If they have allergens in those, if they have mucus, you can do irrigation. You just use boiled water or distilled water that's been sterilized, cool it off, add a salt packet, fill it to the line, you bend over, it goes in one nostril and then out the other, and it basically gets pollen, mucus out of there. Usually if I do the nasal spray, I tell them to do it afterwards so you're putting it into a clean nose. Um, in my opinion, most oral antihistamines are Coke and Pepsi. Um, just making sure I'm on time. Okay, so most of them is on is Coke and Pepsi. I would say that, in my opinion, cetirizine I recommend most of the time because it is inexpensive but effective. However, cetirizine can cause sedation. If you have sedation, you'd want to give fexofenadine. It just costs a little more. One other consideration. Of all the antihistamines in here, one of these is pregnancy category C. Which one is that one? So you got a 33% chance of getting it right. So the correct answer is fexofenadine, all right? Again, pregnancy category C doesn't mean that there's a risk of birth defects per se. I'm just saying it has doesn't have a strong track record as, much, as well as the other two. Um, sedating antihistamines can be effective, but then you're going to actually cause sedation people who are going to work and that sort of thing. So try to stick to a non-sedating antihistamine. So, honey, yes, no. Do you recommend honey? Do patients ask you about honey? What do you tell them about honey? Okay. Okay, so what is the idea about honey? Well... Local honey from your neighborhood has pollen sampled by the bees, and then by ingesting it, you are educating your immune system like oral immunotherapy about the pervasive, the relevant pollens in your area, as long as it's unpasteurized, unfiltered pollen. I mean, you know, uh, honey. Okay. I want you to all take a step back and think about that intellectually. I've just told you that the major mechanism that trees, grasses, and weeds pollinate is wind. And therefore, pollination by uh, wind doesn't need bees, right? Flowers pollinate through bees because they need them. Trees, grasses, and weeds don't need bees. So therefore, the pollen, there is pollen on those bees, and there may be pollen antigen in that honey. But is that relevant to the patient's allergies, right? It's a completely different type of pollen. But again, let's say you wanted to convince yourself 
whether this is really true or not. Well, then you want to go to a resource that's evaluated the literature. So you could PubMed it, or you could take the shortcut, which I do. I go to the national standard. Who has looked at the national standard on the library website? Yes, excellent. You know you're going to get this question, right? If you have a university account, you click this. You get to this website. This is a review of the latest literature and evidence for most alternative medicine therapies. You could put in honey. If you put in honey, you'll get two references. This is one of them. This is a study that uh, initially rolled 30-some patients, but they had some dropouts. So 23 patients with rhinitis confirmed with skin testing. They had three groups. Locally collected, unpasteurized, unfiltered honey, number two, supermarket honey, number three, corn syrup with honey flavor. <laughs> <laughs> One tablespoon daily, follow usual care, primary outcome, decrease of symptom scores on symptom diary, no improvement in either arm compared to placebo. All right? One study, small study. I'm telling you, a study is better than no study, right? Um, they did power it, you know, it, they did a power calculation, but yes, I mean, obviously, if you really want to convince yourself, we could do this big honey um, experiment. Major reason for dropout, too sweet. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways, let's move on. <laughs> well, anyways, okay, let's talk about nasal sprays. So nasal sprays are the most effective medication for allergic rhinitis, uh, treats all the symptoms. Slow onset. So you spray it. Oh, I don't feel anything. Doesn't work. Obviously, daily use over time, the patient will have improvement. You have to set expectations if you're going to give this medicine. you got multiple options. Flonase is over-the-counter, fluticasone. Nasocord is over-the-counter, triamcinolone. This is what they basically took an asthma inhaler called QVAR and turned it into a nasal spray. So again, small particulate um, instead of liquid. So there's lots of choices. Major side effect of nasal steroids I want to address is that um, it can cause nose bleeding. Nose bleeding is usually when the medicine involves the middle, the nasal septums, point away from the of the nose to reduce nasal bleeding. Um, intranasal antihistamines. Effective for both non-allergic and allergic rhinitis. Now you're going to ask me, how can an intranasal antihistamine um, help non-allergic rhinitis? I'm going to tell you I'm not sure. But um, it works. That's all I can tell you. All right. Uh, there's some hypotheses about affecting the neural reflex, but I'm not sure. So... Major side effect of intranasal antihistamines, which is this product here, azelastane, is it tastes awful. So the brand name of this is called Astapro. Tastes less awful because they put Splenda in it, but it still tastes bad. Okay. There is a combined Flonase, I'm sorry, fluticasone azelastane product available. It's called Demista. That's pretty much what I usually give. The patient has good insurance coverage. Otherwise, I would do generic just to make sure it's not too expensive. Atrovent. So ipratropium is available as a nasal uh, spray. It's only good for watery nose. The only time I ever give ipratropium is pre-treatment before eating for someone with terrible gustatory rhinitis, that watery rhinorrhea associated with meals. Pretty much the only reason I use it, actually. Um, Uh-oh. Okay, it's a it's a way. Okay, decongestants. Pseudoephedrine is effective for uh, uh, affecting nasal congestion. The problem is, is that hypertension or cardiovascular effects. And we totally talked about rhinitis medicamentosa. I try to pay, take patients off decongestants, so I would tell you not to use it. All right. So caution with high blood pressure, insomnia, or trying to get pregnant. Um, gastroschisis if trying to get pregnant, all right? So um, especially in the first trimester. Uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists, um, I would say is a drop in the bucket. You can use it if they have concurrent asthma. Probably it's not going to get someone better. Eye drops, most of them are combined mast cell stabilizers, antihistamines, um, ketotifen, 
nafconane or nafazoline, phenyramine, or patidae, which is olopatidine. Um, it's Coke and Pepsi to me. These are twice a day. This is once a day. These three prescriptions are typically once a day. Non-prescription over-the-counter is typically uh, twice a day. Otherwise, I would do as needed unless they're severe. So take-home messages. I told you a lot of information. Take-home messages, number one, consider differential diagnosis. It's not always allergic. There's some conditions you can miss if you're not um, again, paying attention. Number two, please look in the nose. You have the otoscope. So practice your exam. Get to know what normal looks like. Get to know what abnormal looks like. You're going to add it to your repertoire. You're going to address the patient, patient symptoms that, again, I tell you, affects quality of life. Environmental control. You could give medicine to somebody, but before giving them a lot of medicine, can we reduce exposure? And then if you're going to pick one medicine, especially if they fail over-the-counters, you're going to want, well, again, I mean, over-counter antihistamines, you're going to try intranasal medications. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about immunotherapy. I was given two of, till 205. All right. So what is the rationale for immunotherapy? So, you know, there's a lot of conditions in medicine that if you have a condition, you're committing someone to medicine basically indefinitely. As of 2015, we cannot grow new heart tissue after a myocardial infarction. Bully's working on it. I think he's getting there. But until that time, you're going to need to take long-term pharmacotherapy. The allergist immunologist has an intervention where we can turn someone to a tolerant state, and my goal is to get people off medicine, you know? So that's very different. We are trying to get to the root of the condition rather than treating the consequences of inflammation, all right? And so allergen immunotherapy can be used to reduce allergy and asthma symptoms, medication use. For allergic rhinitis and asthma, it may be a quality of life or medication load thing. For stinging insects, we're talking about something that could be potentially life-saving. If someone has anaphylaxis to venom, I can desensitize them so they don't have to live in fear of dying from a bee sting. So that is a definite, strong indication I just want to make you aware of. There's some minor evidence in childhood for uh, developing aller asthma and allergies, but that's beyond the scope of an internal medicine discussion. Okay. Um, who should not get allergy shots? If someone's on a beta blocker, I don't give shots because... It is possible if they have a systemic allergic anaphylactic reaction to the shot, they could have a serious event non-responsive to epinephrine. So we do not give allergy shots typically unless we really, really, really think it's a good idea. For example, they're venom allergic. Now, let's say you are taking on a patient in your clinic who's getting allergy shots. He has a systemic reaction. You find out he's in a beta blocker or he just started it and that slipped by you. He's having anaphylaxis. You get the EpiPen. He doesn't have a good response. You think it's the beta blockade. You want to reverse beta blockade. What is your drug? Glucagon. Correct. All right? Just keep that in mind. So ACE inhibitors, severe asthma, or obviously if they're getting pregnant, you'd probably not start them on shots. If they are pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, usually I hold the dose. I wouldn't escalate someone who is uh, pregnant or planning to get pregnant. So again, in immunotherapy, basically I put what they're allergic to in this vial. I have to dilute it. So one to 10, one to 100, one to 1,000 of the original concentration. I start at a very small, so this is one to 10,000. I start at a very small amount. And I slowly go up on the dose until they reach maintenance, all right? So I usually give it one to three times a week. I like to give it more than once a week because this is going to take a while, right? So I want to move the patient along. Once we're on the maintenance dose, then I give the maintenance dose every week until, um, again, over three to five years. So essentially what I try to do is I try to space it out over time. So I start at weekly at the top dose, then every other week, then every three weeks. And usually patients on maintenance come in once a month on their highest dose of shots. Long-term benefit is after three to five years. You stop it, the tolerance remains. I've had patients come to my office, 
Yeah, I got shots 20 years ago, but I'm still getting my al- I'm getting my allergy symptoms back. Can I go back on shots? And I'm like, 20 years is a pretty good, durable response to shots. I was very impressed. All right, it can be that long lasting for some patients. Um, let's talk about systemics. Chance of a systemic reaction of any systemic reaction is probably around the order of one in a thousand, one zero point one three seven. So that would be like highs or something like that. If we think about near fatal, near fatal reactions would probably be around the order of one point five four million, one point five point five point four million injections. So I just want to let you know that there is a risk of allergic reactions. That's why we have the patient wait for thirty minutes. And you would be done at a doctor's office. On the horizon is sublingual. So this is a tablet that contains pollen. It's, it melts underneath the tongue. There is two products out F, uh, that are FDA approved currently as of 2015. One is grass pollen and one is ragweed pollen. All right. Not indicated for patients with asthma. Was, I'm sorry, very severe asthma or eosinophilic esophagitis. But essentially, I would give the first tablet in my office, and then they take it at home. So they don't have to come in to get allergy shots. So the benefit is, is that, you know, they don't have to come in. The downside is, is that I only have it for two allergens. I really need more in my repertoire. Dust mites on the uh, launching pad. It's coming soon. But again, I'm, I would love more options for my patients. Usually, I start at three or four months prior. And then, remember, they could have reactions too, but it'd be localized itching or swelling. All righty. So that's the end of the talk. I think I ended right on time, but I, I have a couple of minutes if you like, if you have any questions for me.